Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Real Science Exchange, the pubcast where leading scientists and industry professionals meet over a few drinks to discuss the latest ideas and trends in animal agriculture. Hi, I'm Scott Sorrell, one of your hosts here at the Real Science Exchange. Animal agriculture has endured many challenges in recent years to include the COVID pandemic, supply chain disruptions, the Ukrainian war, inflation, and changes in consumer spending power and food preferences related to the rise of the millennial generation and the decline of the more dominant uh, boomer generation. Um, with us today to help us understand the impact of all of this is Melissa Rodriguez and Chris Dubois from IRI. IRI is one of the original innovator, uh, innovators in big data and now integrates the world's largest set of consumer data points to help their customers make sound business decision. Back on October 12th, um, Melissa Rodriguez explored consumer expectations and consumer trends as part of the Real Science Lecture Series. You can view her full webinar at balchem.com slash real science. So first of all, I'd like to welcome uh, Melissa and Chris uh, to the Real Science Exchange. Good to see you here tonight. Thanks Happy for having us. It's good, yeah, it's yeah, a you're, thrill to be here. Real yeah. honor. So thank you. Excellent. Um, Melissa, since you were our, our, our um, featured uh, lecturer, would you mind uh, giving us uh, an overview of yourself? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so I, uh, again, Melissa Rodriguez, I've been with IRI for uh, just a little over, I say just a little, but over 17 years, uh, spanning roles focused on um, change management, you know, uh, data, science, and then have spent a lot of time working directly with our clients, uh, most recently within our protein vertical. All right, very well. And Chris, uh, welcome. You and I met down in uh, San Antonio back, that must have been in July. You did a very interesting presentation down there, and I thought it would be uh, appropriate for our, our uh, audience to hear this kind of information as well. So welcome you to the Real Science Exchange. Uh, would you mind kind of give us an overview of your background and your role at yeah. IRI? Oh, sure. Here at IRI, I lead what we call our protein practice, and Melissa is a, a very key and important part of that. Um, I lead all of our manufacturer accounts. So I'm responsible for client delivery of, of our data, services, et cetera, and all of the teams. Um, so if something goes wrong, I'm the one that you know is ultimately accountable. And at the end of the day, I get to work with fabulous sets of teams and clients kind of day in, day out. All right, very good. Thank you for that. Finally, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Zach Lohman back to the pub. Zach, it's been a while uh, since you've joined us here. Um, you have anything in your glass tonight? Anything exciting? I don't. I'm drinking Diet Dr. Pepper tonight. All right. It's a shame you guys are, are making me drink alone, but it's not the first time. <laughs> um, you know, usually I talk about what's in my glass. Tonight it is Woodford's, but the, the feature is actually a large uh, ball of ice. It looks like a golf ball. And, and, and this is a – I was given a gift uh, for Christmas, a, a mold to make these, these, uh, these golf ball size – or they're bigger than a golf ball – um, ice cubes. And I'll tell you what, it's a game changer. I, I usually don't like to put ice in my bourbon because it waters it down, but these things don't really melt a lot. They, they cool it down. It makes it look mm -hmm. like there's a lot more bourbon in the glass than there really is. Uh, the, the other day I woke up and in the morning there was still about a quarter of uh, the ice cube left in my glass. I was pretty amazed. But anyway, that's enough about bourbon. Let's uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about um, the protein markets. And I'd like to start off talking about IRI, give you guys an opportunity to tell us what IRI does, maybe even what it stands for. Uh, Melissa, would you like to start us off with that? Tonight's pubcast stories are brought to you by Keisher Plus Amino Acid Chelated Minerals from Balchem. Keisher Plus delivers a higher concentration of minerals with a superior amino acid profile. The higher mineral content adds formulation flexibility, opening up space in the diet, and reducing the carbon footprint. The Keisher Plus line also offers a granulated form for improved handling characteristics and reduced dust. Visit balchem.com to learn more. 
Uh, sure, happy to. Um, so IRI, uh, if um, you've, you've been around for a long time, we've had uh, different um, naming conventions over the past 30 odd years that we've we've been around, but currently known as IRI Worldwide. Uh, Information Resources Incorporated was probably one of our long, longest standing uh, descriptors from a from a branding perspective. So IRI at the core, um, you know, is all about the data and all about retailer data. So, um, you know, we're one of the original innovators in big data. We integrate not only that retailer data, loyalty data, media data and shopper and consumer data all together sort of under that big umbrella to help um, retailers and manufacturers within CPG really drive their business forward. So we've got the data that runs the gamut and we've got technology to back it up. So we are kind of on the forefront of helping, like I said, retailers and manufacturers understand the nuances of their business, especially um, you know, in the times that we've had in the last couple of years. All right, very well, thank you for that. Chris, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what what's the geographic uh, reach that you guys have? Do you look at, are you kind of North America centric? Are you a global company? We are, glo uh, we, ha we have global reach, but we're very North America centric. So we're very strong here in the U.S. That's where we're, we, we've been headquartered for a lot of years, but we have strong operations and strong teams out in Europe, Asia Pacific, um, and all around the world, actually. So from that side, we can bring in insights and data if you want it from the Netherlands, or we could bring it in from New Zealand, but um, yeah, at the end of the day, most of the heritage here started in the U.S., and that's kind of where, honestly, the U.S. has the best data, too, from a global side, okay. at least in terms of what's selling from a, a food food and retail piece. Yeah. I mean, at any point in time, we can be on calls with clients who span, and, and um, Melissa works for one as well. It has global operations. So those, the way our data kind of flows and touches um, makes a big difference in clients' business. Very well. So saying, you know, when I hear data, data is kind of backward looking. It's it's history, uh, right? And I'm I'm curious about how you take that data and then how far into the future do you look and project with that? And That's a good question. Uh, for mo the most part, for people who aren't as familiar with IRI, we see every item that's sold in each store every day here in the U.S. You know, so if you think of everything you went into a Walmart and wanted to buy, we 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 see it on the food side. And then we have uh, 60 million frequent shopper cards that we track as well. So if you ever wanted to know, does someone know kind of what you bought? The answer is, yeah, yeah, we do in great detail. Um, but, you know, the big, the big side of this, I think, is you know, trying to make sure we can drive it in a useful way with manufacturers and retailers. So this is all about driving growth, how to drive um, pricing and assortment helping them make big marketing and sales changes as well. But it also helps drive um, some of the future decisions. So we can forecast data um, five years out for sales you know, on that side. It becomes something that if people want to know where, where are sales going, we can do that. Um, on the other hand, there are big changes from a generational side that are happening. Demographics happen really slow. In other words, it's not a secret. Millennials have been around for a while. You know, This is a very well-defined age group. But on the other hand, there, as you look at their changes and how they roll forward, it gives you some real predictive capability in terms of what likes are, are likely to be. And you can begin to pick up on what I call the big three to five year changes. So these are the things that really, really matter. Um, in other words, you could play day to day and wonder about what items are gonna go in circulars. And sure, every, every week a retailer has an item on promotion. There might be displays, there's gonna be price changes. And all that moves volume and all it's, all that's really important. But then there are some big changes that happen a little bit more slowly, but when you get in front of those, they really decide which companies win, which ones lose. Um, and that goes all the way through the chicken world, but it happens in every category. And, and some of those big changes, that's what you'll hear Melissa and I talk about uh, often in, in terms of the big trends, because the manufacturers that win those big battles are the ones that wind up five years from now feeling much better about life. And then there are some that kind of are going to struggle and they're wondering like, wow, what happened? And doing that day in, day out, fighting the fires thing isn't, isn't the best way to capture the big wins long term. 
Very well. I'm looking forward to, to exploring some of those those big trends that you guys have identified. Uh, before we kind of get into that, uh, Melissa, one of the things that you covered during your webinar was some things that's happened in the recent past that are still impacting us today, and, and that's COVID and inflation. And uh, kind of wanted to give you an opportunity to kind of talk about what are some of the, the things that, uh, that that changed and uh, how's that going to impact us going forward? Yeah, so I think... No, we're currently still in the midst of high inflationary times. So some categories are seeing some differences in how um, you know pricing is working and and how um, how consumers their their spending habits. Um, but in general, right when we're seeing price increases still well above double digit increases over the past year, and you combine that with different things, um, you know avian influenza, supply chain issues that are still plaguing certain categories or certain industries. Um, you know, it's still remaining, quote unquote, the perfect storm of, of consumers having to make trade offs and tough decisions around um, what they're going to be spending their, their dollars on, um, especially as cost of living across the board continues to increase. So we're noticing that at the shelves, right? We're noticing that as prices continue to rise or remain elevated, um, people aren't buying as much, right, in certain areas, or they're maybe switching to um, smaller pack sizes or to club pack sizes to maybe stretch that dollar further or we're seeing people trading down from a brand perspective. So they might have in the past bought, bought that um, national brand. And today they're maybe looking or um, comparing prices across a store brand alternative. So just really a lot of um, scrutiny happens, um, you know, at the shelf and, and all the way to that purchase. Uh, more so than we've seen during COVID, right? During, during the pandemic, it was very much, I'm going to buy what I can find um, because that, that flip that we've seen continues to sort of play out and will, you know, at least through 2023. Melissa, one of the things I found interesting from your presentation um, was that uh, during, during COVID, people began to eat more uh, at home as opposed to going out more. And uh, I'm just kind of curious if, if that did that impact uh, not only where they ate, but, but what they ate as well. Would you mind kind of maybe expounding on that just a bit? Sure. So, um, you know, prior to the pandemic, uh, about 53% of the wallet share of food was purchased, uh, was food at home, right? So just a little over half of food was purchased for the home. Um, it, that rose significantly during the pandemic and has actually remained elevated. So that share of wallet for food at home is, is still sitting at about 78%. So what's interesting, though, is that when we look at from an inflationary perspective, the risen uh, at a greater rate than the cost of inflation or cost of um, eating out. The difference, though, is still that eating out costs more, right, on like a per plate type of basis. Yeah, I'm curious if 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 the, the the change in the fact that it's enduring that we're eating more at home is that due to the fact that a lot of us are still working from home, or at least a higher percent of the time than we were prior to COVID. Kind of going through, but work from home has been one of the biggest, I think, lifestyle changes that, that we've seen in in generations. So the if you go back to 2017, um, about seven percent of the U.S. population, working population, worked at home. So very very few, and at most it was in, intermittent. Now you're going to see levels of close to 30%. That's sort of a good floor to think about. So basically, we've seen a, a almost a quadrupling, if not more, of people working at home. Well, what does that mean outside of like cute jokes about Zoom calls and Teams and blah, blah, blah? All that's, it's less about the work style than it is about from an eating side and more about the fact that people have time to plan meals. So all of a sudden, the whole idea of snacking, work at home breakfast becomes a big deal. That whole idea of I'm going to drive, hit a drive through on my way to the office, it's a little bit harder now. And you can begin to see that from the food service marketing side, that they are trying to pull that traffic in or get people out of their homes to come back in. The same thing for a work from home lunch, all the downtown cafeterias, a lot of the downtown restaurants, you're seeing empty storefronts, not because business is horrible and we're in some kind of recession. It's simply because people are working in different locations. So suburban locations now are adding two, three, four drive-throughs uh, in a lot of restaurants. 
trying to get people to come through and drive through and take home. So that the whole idea that work from home is a temporary thing um, is really mistaken. I think it's gonna be one of the biggest changes we'll see going forward that'll reset everything from office properties to, to drive times, but also more importantly is to my world, the eating side, because it changes meal prep, meal location, and uh, that's gonna drive all the economics between supermarkets and food service. You know, related to that, I'm I'm kind of curious what role maybe some of the delivery services have had and will have, kind of like DoorDash, right? I, I don't I don't partake, but I know my kids do. That's part of what they do. Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think that's been one of the big. Yeah, that's been coming for a, a lot of years. So that's that was even pre-COVID um, in terms of the growth, and it's been hundreds of percent over over time. So it's it's become a big industry on its own. I think the big pushback is going to be whether restaurants can take over their own delivery service or manage in a different way, because it is a big margin drain in restaurants. Uh, but nonetheless, the whole idea that food can be convenient, it's going to be in a different location. You don't have to go sit down in a restaurant or sit down at your house. The fact that food is mobile now is a really big idea because it changes products. All of a sudden, if you're in food service, your product might have to be packaged and be portable and not just plated to look great. So that whole idea of keeping sauces um, consistent, you know, trying to keep things like French fries from uh, not getting bad between the restaurant and the house, like, that's a big deal. Or the fact that you could even have food delivered to a third location, not your house or not your restaurant. Um, all that's possible. So I think what it does is just takes place out of the whole idea of, of where you eat food. In other words, you could eat at any place. You don't have to go to a restaurant or eat it at your house. And, and what has impact has that, if any, had on the, um, the source of the protein that's being consumed uh, by that? Uh, and I'm talking about chicken, pork, beef, um, aqua, fish. Yeah, I'd say fish will always kind of struggle in that environment, but it changes um, it changes a little bit of the format. So if you think of tacos, like where did that come from? One, it was a flavor flavor piece and, and, and a lot of different pieces, but it's portable, it's movable, and you can put it in a lot of different locations, including pop-ups. Um, so all of a sudden that experimentation uh, changes dramatically. I think what what's really going to matter is that um, the creativity. So chicken chicken has a different benefit than beef in terms of, um, you know, of the groups that it serves and, and whatnot. But chicken takes flavors extremely well. So in other words, you can, you can do an awful lot with it. The question becomes, where do you do it in the formulation? Do you do it in, right, you know, in advance? Um, or is it something that you're doing right at, you know, as you plate, as you plate, uh, plate a protein? But I think in the food service side, the big piece, the big question is going to be portability. And, and how you can cook it and make it last through that trip to the house, whether it's a consumer taking it away or being delivered to them or simply that they're going to go make it at their own house. So. Mm -hmm. Melissa, during your uh, presentation, you talked a little bit about the fact that uh, consumers are now buying uh, different ways to prepare the food, be it a, a smoker or an air fryer or or one of these Instapots. I'm, I'm curious um, what what, if any, impact that's had on the source of the protein and maybe even the cuts of the, uh, of the meats that, that uh, consumers are consuming? Yeah, so I would say, um, you know, we've seen a lot of uptick in chicken thighs and chicken wings um, for, for one example, right? So people are able to smoke them, grill them in the air fryer. And so just the ability to have some of those items that you maybe weren't comfortable cooking before, like chicken wings, out of the home and now having the ability to uh, create, you know, create recipes around those, um, some of those cuts. Pork tenderloin is another one, right? Throw that on the smoker. Um, and that's another one that we've seen really, really take off um, due to some of those, uh, um, you know, kitchen tools. Zach, I don't want to, I don't want to hog all this. you have anything you'd like to ask? Yeah, I've got a question. So we're just coming out of the holiday season and with AI and shortages and cost of turkeys is my main question. D did you see a, a change in uh, the amount of turkeys purchased or how many were available? 
the availability was actually pretty good. We found turkeys to be a little bit smaller this year. Part of that's they just um, producers harvested them a little sooner. So instead of seeing the big, big birds, there's a little bit fewer of those and a lot more of the midsize coming through. And some of that was just trying to make sure it was all there. Um, but there was plenty of turkey out there. In fact, this was a record year again. Uh, big, big, big time purchases um, overall. And I think what was a little different this year than last year um, was just the fact that a lot of the big specials and pricing uh, held off till the week or two before. So if you, if you, well, if you're like me, I walked in about a, a month before because I was going to buy a frozen turkey, but I needed about a 24 pound turkey. I knew if I wanted a big turkey and I wanted it set, I'm just not going to play the drum, you know, try to be, you know, riding the edge right down a few days before Thanksgiving. So I picked it up early and bought some other stuff out there as well. But if you waited, you know, you could save an awful lot on that turkey. It, it could be, you know, almost half price by that time, by the time they got it down. So we saw the same promotions. They were just in different windows, uh, but still a very big year from a uh, Thanksgiving side. And, um, you know, we saw similar things coming in Christmas and around New Year's too. I guess the net net is from a consumer side, things were still really strong, despite, you know, some of the headlines and all that other kind of stuff. Yep. I was wondering if the headlines kind of made people rush out and get them sooner because they were afraid they wouldn't be able to get one. No, there was a lot of that. And I think retailers were pretty savvy. I mean, I wish I'd know. I think I bought the turkey just before I had a discussion at an industry conference about what the pricing of turkeys was going to be at a few retailers. I'm like, darn it, I missed it because I wound up paying like a buck, you know, a buck 49. I could have gotten it for 79 later if I'd waited. But, you know, that's the break. So, you know, um, but, you know, at the end of the day, I think what retailers were trying to do is just figure out who, who, for the people who are going to wait and and hope something went on deal, those people got their deals. And if you wanted someone like me who just wanted some peace of mind that, you know, we'd be able to serve 14 people and not have a ton of drama outside of the usual whatever family drama, um, you know, that part made it a lot easier for me to kind of prep it. So, no, it's okay. So we we did see sales kind of grow. You know, sides were fairly strong this year and um, um, consumer, but, you know, in, as Melissa mentioned, inflation is taking its toll. But what we're seeing is people are pandemic and the, the time spent um, cooking, you know, is still paying off. The people, despite high, higher prices, are still cooking at home. And has the, the, the inflation changed again? Uh, what kind of protein we are consuming, whether that be um, poultry, pork, beef, uh, how's that changed? And then also the cuts, uh, more or less. Uh, Whole chickens, I'm just kind of curious. That's a broad question, I know, but. I'd say there's kind of three big drivers. That chicken had a fabulous year last year. It was up up big on dollars, and very strong on volume. Um, I think chicken had the, the benefit of being a lower price product overall. So in other words, relative to beef and pork and, and some of the others, even if it's higher priced, it's still relatively lower on that bit. But there's there's been three big areas of chicken that are really mattered. So one is dark meat. Um, if you look at white meat versus dark meat and kind of separate that out going five years back, um, dark meat's grown just enormously. And part of that's due, I think, to taste preferences. You see a lot of recipes out now for the for legs, thighs, and and one of the biggest innovations has been boneless thighs. Um, that's a seven hundred million dollar growth over twenty seventeen. In terms of dollars, like that, that's one of the biggest new products in, inside the entire supermarket, if you think about it that way. Um, and you say, well, boneless thighs, well, thighs were there, Chris. Like, it's not a surprise. It's not new, right? But the whole idea that you could carve it and make it boneless through processing and make it very easy to prepare, but also take all kinds of flavors and add into a bunch of dishes, like, that's a really big deal. Like that's one of the coolest new products that's come out in the supermarket and it's worth that, you know, $700 million in the swing. So that, that white meat to dark meat is, is a really big deal. And Melissa mentioned wings. I mean, shoot, we almost had a national security concern last year because we <laughs> couldn't find enough wings. I think there was at some point I was talking about trying to figure out how we get um, four wings on a bird. Hmm. Yeah. Because we just can't find it, find enough, but um but that the the power of dark meat along with organic 
and uh, value add have just been three huge drivers that have made a big difference in the chicken business. Now, those wings being consumed at home, I typically think of those being consumed outside at the, you know, the, the Buffalo Wild Wings or whatever, but it's funny at industry conferences because if you run into food service procurement professionals and you run into retail buyers, I mean, there's sort of the elbows up thing. They know they know the battle in front of us in many cases. They're just there weren't enough. Um, but, you know, a lot of the wings came out of what Melissa talked about on air fryers. Like if you run back 10 years ago, it, those weren't there. But now it's become especially if you have teenage boys, that's that's a very preferred afternoon snack and it's easy for people to put together, it's become an easy way to prep meals. In fact, there's whole product sets that are built around it. If you don't have an air fryer recipe and a lot of your stuff in frozen, you're probably missing an awful lot of sales. When you talk about the, the air fryers, uh, the, here at my household, my wife's got an Instapot, and we have made a switch from some of the white meat to dark meat because of that. She's able to put those thighs in that Instapot, and uh, you know, kind of melts away that cartilage, and uh, that's pretty good eating. So one data yeah. point, right? <laughs> yeah, the Instapots, air fryers, I mean, those kind of things, you, if you go back 10 years, like they, they sort of might have been there, but not really. Um, but now if you'd say 60, you know, a big chunk of American households have, um, Instapots of some kind, you know, whether it's a branded one or a different, different brand of it, uh, but that changes the way you cook. The recipes are there. Um, and you can even take, take things from frozen to, uh, to cooked in a very short time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the manufacturers and, and processors that can, um, really share and drive the recipes and drive it all the way into into um, baskets is a big deal so yeah you know another area i kind of wanted to dig into to see uh to get your thoughts on it is the the uh the ukrainian war and the impact that may have on consumers and suppliers here in the states right uh, you know i think the ukraine is kind of considered the breadbasket of Europe. A lot of the fertilizers are coming out of Russia and Ukraine that, that we use here domestically to, to make grains to, that, that, that we consume, that our animals consume. And just kind of curious, you know, as you put that kind of data and information into your models, what's some of the answers you're getting back? Uh, it was probably one of the big concerns last year and even going into this year. I mean, if you look at um, some of the West Coast producers, they bought grain from overseas so all of a sudden when that avenue gets shut off there's an awful lot of grain that needs to move east to west here in the u.s to feed the chickens and that's that's one of the biggest costs when you look at you know all the different things that go into making a chicken it's chicken feed you know not to belabor it but you know that the economics behind that are a big big deal and that's that's kind of what's driving the processors crazy at this point um, just because prices are coming down a little bit now on the chicken side. In fact, I think from the wholesale side, they're cut in half. Um, but chicken feed continues to be fairly high priced. So that that is probably one of the biggest stories, I think, for 23 is for, re, uh, for processors to manage, be able to manage the costs, whether they can do it on the inside side if they're vertically integrated or if they have to take the prices from the outside uh, to feed the animals. Related to that, um... You know, if you listen to some economists, they're they're predicting perhaps uh, a recession in our future, and what what impact do you see that having? And uh, is, have you uh, considered that in in some of your calculations and modeling? Yeah, I'd say for next year, we're looking at you know still dollar sales growing volume with some softness, but a lot of it comes down to scenario based. I don't think anything that I've seen predicts major, major recessions, at least that I have, you know, would have a lot of confidence. I think it feels more like a softer, softer type pullback for the most part. Um, and that's kind of where we've been working with clients on in terms of, you know, we see dollar growth, dollar growth sort of mid, mid single digit range, depending on the category of items, um, but probably some, some low single digit loss in volume. Very well. You know, I'd kind of like to change gears and, and, and talk a little bit about the future, right? We've got these younger generations coming up. Uh, their buying power is increasing. Boomers, most of them are retiring now. Uh, their buying patterns are, and spending patterns are changing. Uh, would you mind 
talking a little bit about that and some of the, I think you mentioned five big trends coming out of all that and maybe talk a little bit about that. You know, when we think of what's coming and it's and it's not on the horizon tomorrow, but it's but it's coming and it's going to be building up to the year 2030. Right. So in the year 2030, that's when the turning point for our U.S. population has a has the biggest shift. So half of all Americans will be millennials, Gen Z or even younger. So when we're thinking about what does that mean for consumers? Right. What does that what does that entail for how people shop and how we're going to engage with them? So when you think about it today, boomers buy what they buy, right? Millennials buy what they buy and Gen Z's as their spending power increases, they buy what they buy. None of those, like if you're thinking of those three, you know, three things as columns, none of those columns are alike. And so if you're a retailer or a manufacturer, you have to now cater to every single one of those columns or every single one of those generational cohorts, right? You have to have product availability for all of them. You have to know and understand what drives their household, what what things they're interested in, right? From whether it's economic, uh, social responsibility, right? They're all different. And so having to play this game over the next decade is going to get really interesting because that's what we're going to see shifting is that if today your consumers are primarily, you know, sitting in boomer camp or, you know, even a little bit of Gen X camp, that won't look the same for you as the manufacturer five plus years down the road or even starting, you know, next year, because you cannot have um, the same offerings today a decade from now. Right. So that's sort of that's what we're really looking at. And so that's a big driver of those trends that, you know, Chris has coined it sort of the changing of the guard. And so that shift of what we'll see coming over the next you know year to nine, 10 years out is what's going to be important for everyone to sort of get a get an understanding of. And so that changing of the guard isn't just the products that are on the shelves, right? They, they like different items. They like different spice levels. They like different uh, ethnic foods. So that's one thing, you know, at the very, at the very sort of core of it, but it's more, how do you talk to them? How do you engage with them? What's important to those different groups? So product innovation is, is a big trend of that, especially coming out of a pandemic where that sort of, you know, staled out or stalled out a little bit. Um, so that will continue to be of importance to drive variety, um, especially as you're fighting for dollars. Um, another thing that we see uh, very important is digital engagement. For the first time, we're going to be hitting a generation that, um, you know, from the term digital natives, they don't know anything but having a world with digital capabilities at their fingertips or at the ready, right? This is the first non-dial-up generation. And so what does that mean? And it means a lot because there's instant knowledge, there's instant um, gratification and just instant, instant sharing. And so that that also changes what, what you know access they have. And so if you're a retailer or a manufacturer, you have to think about then how you engage with those consumers and what you're going to share with them. And then the last thing I'll say, it's not five trends, but this is another one that kind of fits into, you know, what I would call our top three is this, this is around sustainability. So I mentioned earlier, right, what's important to them, that's important. And it's important to all generations, but the definition of what sustainability is and what is important varies greatly generation by generation. So that's just another way that we'll have to be thinking about the consumers that will drive the next 10 to 30 years of purchasing, right? And their children. I think that that's further, right? It's going to continue to evolve with future generations, but it's this millennial and Gen Z pocket that um, that we have to really pay attention to for the next decade, at least. Very interesting. Uh, so much to uh, unpack there. The, if you will, um, help me get a handle on how is that going to impact uh, animal agriculture? Um, some of these differences. Um, what impacts that going to have? Do you have some insight into that? We do. So, you know, when we think about, so let's, I think millennials is probably where, where, where I'd start with that. But when we look at what's in a basket, right, in a shopping basket of a millennial versus a boomer, that varies um, in, in certain items at a higher level, right? Oat milk skews for younger consumers, soup skews for older consumers. When we dig into the protein level of that, though, this is where we're seeing meat alternatives uh, having a larger role or a larger presence in a basket 
basket for those younger consumers and millennials. Um, you know, uh, something like ground turkey is another one that skews to a younger generation, um, whether it's for health halo, other, uh, you know, lots of reasons, but they're cooking with it um, a lot more than, than the boomer cohort is. Um, on that flip side, right, today, the items that skew from a protein perspective to boomers pork tenderloin, veal, raw turkey breast, right? So those are some key items. So it doesn't mean that those younger generations don't buy them, but they're buying a lot less. So when you're thinking, if you're in any of those industries or even other ones, right, from a protein perspective, if your share of wallet for millennials is lower, you're going to have to pay attention to how to bring them in. If you're a, if you're a turkey producer and they're only potentially buying your ground turkey, you have to educate them on how on raw turkey breast and what to do with that and how to bring that maybe into their basket for consideration. I actually uh, just bought a smoker and uh, I play on the TikTok a lot and they have a lot of people that are out there smoking all these different recipes. So I actually just bought a whole bunch of uh, pork tenderloin. So I'm actually making one of those tonight, but uh, I've never cooked one before uh, until I started seeing it on the internet or on different places. It's funny how that picks up, right? I mean, TikTok becomes sort of that platform of choice. If you think about what really rocked the world in the last three years, I mean, it was it was really that platform. I mean, that's where ideas go viral. And honestly, we've got so many different examples of just TikTok itself, because it's so popular, knocked out, knocked items out of supply chains. Um, and that happens all across the store, not just in food. It's like it becomes so popular. Everybody wants it. And then it's out of stock. <laughs> Um, but you know, that whole idea of, of how that Melissa talked about, it is a really huge deal between boomers and, and millennials. And I, I'm just sort of looking at myself as Gen X. So we're somewhere in the middle that no one's ever talking about, but if you think about boomers <laughs> with all the dollars, I mean, boomers buy 22% more veal than the average U S household. If, if you're, a um, millennial, you're buying 28% less than the average U S household. That balance says, if I'm a veal processor, I've got a lot of work to do just to break even. And, and, and breaking even with today. I mean, so forget about trying to grow it. There's a lot of catch up to do over the course of the year. And that, that's exactly what Melissa was talking about in terms of um, some of those changes. But chicken's pretty well advantaged. Um, chicken's had the benefit of um, pretty good sales leaning from that side, both. Um, chicken breast, but also dark meat uh, that, that has been a big driver of it. You know, one thing I was wondering is, so we we, we understand the, the buying habits and preferences of these different generational groups today. How much do we know about how their preferences change over time? Will will the uh, will the millennials be buying like the the boomers someday or or will they will they keep keep that with them? Uh, th those preferences. I think you're going to see some of those change a little bit over time, but they may not, they're not going to go all the way to where boomers or Gen X. So if you follow Gen X and you take, roll some of that back 10, 20 years, you find that Gen X tended to follow the boomer path pretty well. In other words, a lot of the same items are coming out. What you see from millennials and Gen Z is there's very hard decisions that, that kind of take some products totally out of the mix. That's and that's just not picking on proteins. That's like picking on condiments like ketchup, probably going to get smaller beer, probably going to get smaller over time, space wise on that side of the store. But it doesn't mean that um, people don't buy any products. It just means they're buying different ones. So right. some categories are going to expand Asian cooking oils. If you look in cooking oils, vegetable oil gets smaller, Asian cooking oil and other ones get larger just because people, millennials are buying more. So if you're a marketer of products that are advantaged towards millennials, or you have a brand that millennials really like, it's going to feel like you're the best marketer in the world because like, wow, sales just keep going up. I'm just magical and I can do all this stuff. But you know, you may take the best marketer in the world. And if you're in a boomer driven product in a boomer driven category, it's going to feel like, man, I'm running into this 50 mile headwind and I just can't make any progress. It is so hard doing what I'm doing. Um, less about the talent than just more about the buyer groups that are out there pulling the products. Mm -hmm. uh, Melissa, you mentioned before, uh, talk about meat alternatives. Um, and I'm 
you know, I think I've heard recently the like the Beyond Meats or the Impossible Burgers, they might have been losing some ground recently. Uh, can, can you talk to that maybe a little bit about the rise of that and maybe maybe the opposite? Um, what may be going on with that? Yeah. So what we've noticed um, recently, um, you know, and, and part of it, I think, is there's an availability play. And then there's also just some um, uh, different experiments that retailers have done. So from a price perspective, um, you know, some of them have also incurred some of those double digit price increases. And so when everything is rising, we've seen some folks kind of go back to some of the staple protein items. Um, the other thing that we've seen uh, is that some retailers were, were playing around putting some of those items more in the refrigerated sets. And that's actually been backed off a little bit. So I was part of a different conversation uh, a couple of weeks ago um, with some retailers and they had noted that, that they had experimented with putting it in the refrigerated set next to other burger patties, next to other items like that. And it didn't belong. It didn't necessarily fit there. So they bumped it back on the frozen side. So it's not necessarily playing with fresh meat as much as I think um, it maybe was off the bat. And I think it's been relegated or maybe, you know, for some consumers is being relegated back to that, that sort of frozen aisle standpoint. So if you're looking for a fresh protein item, that's not necessarily at the top of your list right now because you've maybe moved that to the, to the other area of the store or your other consideration for meals. But that's what we, that's what we heard from retailers recently. Um, and I think it just, again, the, the pricing piece continues to make people wonder um, if that's where they're going to put their dollars, especially right now when dollars continue to have to be stretched and, and kind of vetted against one another. Very well. You know, uh, maybe a similar uh, a discussion, but I, I hear younger people or people on, on the Internet talk about factory farms and the fact that, you know, uh, our, our, our industry, uh, the larger farms tends to be out of favor with some of the younger generations. And maybe can you talk a little bit about that and how that um, may relate to the phenomena of, of buying locally and, and some of those dynamics? Who would like to take that? Yeah, I'd say in in general, you know, if you look at the American population today, um, you know, less than one percent really farms. So the and the distance between today's consumers and and real farmers and just even how animals are raised, you know, the care that's taken with them, the, the, all the dollars and and science behind veterinary care, animal care, et cetera, all the way through, it's just not known. And, and part of that is. You know, it, it's easy to think about, well, gee, maybe we should go educate people, but good Lord, trying to educate people in the middle of all this content that's out there. If you think of all the movies, all the shows, all the other stuff that absorbs people's time, like that's hard. Um, so the hard part is that stigma of, of factory farms is sort of in people's minds. So the, to me, the, the challenge is trying to break through and, and make make the packages and make the marketing just work a lot more to be able to tell the story. And some some companies are doing a great job on that in terms of you know of how they talk about it. So farmer focus is one of those smaller, kind of high-end organic ones, but they they tie pictures of farmers, they tie the stories of where the farms are coming from to that. But you can do that at scale. You can do that in a big beef, in a beef ranching side. You can do that in chicken farm. Um, there's really nothing kind of holding that back except the data points and that willingness to go do it. But I think it's changing the consumer's mindset without telling them all the stuff we're doing, if you know what I mean. Like, in other words, um, the industry is doing an awful lot of good things from how it manages animals and, and the care it goes in and, and everything else. But we're just not getting the credit. So to me, it's um, changing how the companies talk and market about that is a big deal because you can put you know um, qr codes on packages to take people back to where where the farm is and that that alone breaks the paradigm of where this animal was raised or where these animals came from et cetera et cetera and that can be done at scale as well as uh you know on a local side but at the end of the day i think people will kind of drive for local as a proxy to get closer because they believe that transparency increases yeah, you know, the more you know about a product. 
Okay. Have you seen a shift with, uh, I guess, overall inflation and just everything costing more, more of a shift from store brand to organic to conventional or I know eggs, for example, I, I've always, well, I always have eggs because I, you know, have animals, but um, I mean, they've just even store brand ones have more than doubled when you could normally get a dozen eggs for $1.50 or so. I think last time I looked, they were like over $4. And the organic eggs were up in eight, nine dollars a dozen. It's just uh, I didn't know if uh, the trend keeps going once things hit a certain, certain threshold, or if people are still as committed as they were, or if there's kind of been some hesitation there. Yeah, if you have access to eggs, you are a rich man indeed. <laughs> 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 but um, no, that's been one of the craziest categories I've ever seen. Yeah, it wasn't too long ago we're at ninety nine cents a dozen. Now it's you're right, it's closer to four and I think it's higher, you know, just because I've slowed down. I know my purchases on some of that, even at that point. But um, yeah, what we've seen is it's been fairly, you know, volume's been strong all the way through. Like we haven't seen the big drop offs. If you went back four years ago and said, hey, I'm going to, I got an idea. I'm just going to raise the price like to $4 a dozen. And, you know, if we all do that, we're going to make a fortune. Like who would have known, right, that it actually would have worked? Just because the total dollars are coming in, even if you lose a little bit of volume, you're making it, making it up there on the dollar side. Um, but I think, you know, that said, at some point there is the exhaustion factor. And I think that's where you're starting to see the organic ones start to hit. Like I've noticed the premium dropping quite a bit between conventional and organic. And I think that that begins to kind of focus people's um, changes and trade offs as well. You know, in other words, if, if it's four fifty for conventional, and gee, the retailer forgot to change their pricing, so it's only four eighty five for the you know organic. I'll pick the organic at that point, but um, you know, I think the big thing is just, I think people just really kind of wanted to get back to something normal, and I think we're all sort of hoping you know high path avian flu goes away, you know, at some point, or at least mitigates. So as we kind of winding down here, are there any big trends or discussions that uh, that our audience needs to hear about that we haven't covered yet? Um, well, I'd say Melissa hit hit a lot of those big topics. Um, yeah, I think sustainability from yeah the consumer. What's the getting the consumer ROI and sustainability will be one of the big topics over the next five years. So, if I look at all the wonderful things, every you know almost every meat company is lining up. If you talk to their heads of sustainability, you talk to their leadership teams, there's endless forms and Excel trackers and project trackers of all the different things that are used to kind of save money, save water um, and help the environment. But what what to me and I think um, what I found out just talking to like 24 different chief marketing officers a couple of years ago was if you ask them, are you getting a return on this? Do the consumers value what you're doing? In other words, they believe it's real, but will they give you more money because of what you're doing or will you take share from other other products? The answer so far has come back. They're not seeing it. So I think what you're going to see at some point over the next five years is people as, as companies begin to change their business models all in to make sustainability part of what they're doing, but also to get credit from the consumer side. And, and that means changing packaging. You know, communicating differently um, and probably going to market in different ways. But I think ultimately it's there's going to be that demand for ROI that's going to be a big deal. So that looking at it through the consumer's eyes, I think, will be probably one of the most important parts and taking it out of sort of the, I call it the random acts of good citizenship approach. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the trends uh, that, that we've been talking about this afternoon, uh, I think, have been kind of. Uh, North America centric or U.S. centric, have we seen a lot of the same trends and changes globally? Yeah, actually, I think Europe, and for the most part, leads the U.S. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, it's always easy to say, "Gee, we're awesome here in the U.S." And doesn't the whole world kind of just feed off of us? Honestly, a lot of these trends and a lot of the same ideas have come over from Europe in many cases. So, okay. um, if I look, if if you, I would often, I would offer just offer out saying it. If you want to see some leading trends, walk to supermarkets in Europe, you know, for a, a, a week or so and 
you know, you'll see some different merchandising tactics as well as just different ways of products. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, processors talk to yeah you know, market market to uh, customers. There, it's it's a big deal. So I'm not saying Europe's perfect, but there's an awful lot of good ideas that float over there first. Yeah, makes sense. All right. I don't know if you guys noticed, but they just flickered the lights, which means it is last call, and I am out of bourbon, so that means. Uh, last call um <laughs> so uh you know that ice what i'd like to going strong right it is <laughs> unfortunately that's all that's left um anyway uh what i'd like to do in closing is is have you guys uh take or 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 or, or talk about two key things that marketers and those of us in agriculture need to be aware of and watch for the next uh, year or so um as these changing of the guard takes place. Our last call question is brought to you tonight by Puricol. Look to Puricol choline chloride from Balchem to deliver the highest standards of quality, backed by the strictest process controls, for a level of purity, safety, and consistency you won't find anywhere else. And why don't I start, Zach, with you? Yeah, so I think, I guess my overall is I think that food is very important to everybody now and for the future and uh for um a company be to be successful they need to start looking towards the future seeing what people are wanting and not just keep going on the path that they've been on for years Mm -hmm. yeah thank you for that uh melissa yeah i think my um my biggest uh thing that i would focus on um is as uh, inflation continues or starts to, you know, potentially come down, I would look at that response rate for key categories and especially within protein of how each generation responds to those changes, because I think that will give us good indicators for what we can expect for the the coming years, right? The last few years have been an anomaly to say the least, Um, but as things maybe get to some level of quote unquote uh, normalcy, those could be really good indicators uh, for the future of how generational differences could drive uh, purchases or purchasing behavior. All right. Thank you, Melissa, for that. And Chris, uh, any final comments? Yeah, well, Melissa nailed the consumer side. So basically, that's, that's kind of what I was going to say on that one. But, okay. but if I had to think about it from, from a marketer side, this is going to be one of the more pivotal years coming up in a long time. So what we saw for the last few years is people raise prices very specifically because they had to cover costs. It's not, you know, no one's evil or whatever else. But nonetheless, we're at a point where prices are high. But I think you can, it's fair to expect a lot of the transportation costs and other ones to start coming down over time. And you can feel it from the big retailers start to look for discounts and savings saying, hey, I know it doesn't cost that much to move a truck from here to there, don't charge me that much. So quietly you'll hear it through the manufacturer community that retailers are really starting to pull on that. So to me, I think you're gonna see a big chance for share shifts in the next year in terms of which manufacturers can manage the cost well enough and also who are smart enough to manage price on this side because as prices go from high to lower, not everybody needs to give back that profit, but you're going to see a pretty big difference in terms of who, who's got the tools and who's, who's looking through the, uh, the data really closely and, and who's not. Because mm-hmm. someone's, you know, people are going to start, you're going to see a big separation go, uh, over the next year in terms of people who are on top of it. Yeah, yeah good. Well, Melissa, Chris, Zach, uh, I want to thank you guys for the insightful conversation tonight and uh, the insights into uh, consumers. Um, It's been a departure from our typical topics, and I've really enjoyed it. I find this kind of information fascinating, which is why after hearing you, Chris, uh, down there in San Antonio, I invited uh, you to do a webinar for us. I I think this is information that we all uh, can really appreciate. Uh, And I think our our listeners uh, will enjoy it as well. And to our loyal listeners, uh, once again, thank you for joining us at the pub table tonight and taking a deeper dive in tonight's topic. As always, I hope you learned something. I hope you had some fun. And I hope to see you next time here at the Real Science Exchange where it's always happy hour and you're always among friends. We'd love to hear your comments or ideas for topics and guests. 
so please reach out via email to anh.marketing at balchem.com with any suggestions, and we'll work hard to add them to the schedule. Don't forget to leave a five-star rating on your way out. You can request your Real Science Exchange t-shirt in just a few easy steps. Just like or subscribe to the Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your address and t-shirt size to anh.marketing at balchem.com. Balchem's Real Science Lecture Series of webinars continues with ruminant-focused topics on the first Tuesday of every month, monogastric-focused topics on the second Tuesday of each month, and quarterly topics for the companion animal segment. Visit balchem.com slash real science to see the latest schedule and to register for upcoming webinars. Music